Hello, welcome to Come Learn with Paula. I'm so glad that you will be joining me today. Uh, we will be going through the second half of John chapter six. So if you haven't already heard the first half, I would suggest you pause the video, go back and watch the one before. Also, if you'd like to answer today's questions, they are found under the video. Press the more button and down below you will see the questions. We're gonna cover question nine through 15. And so if you'd like to answer them beforehand, please do. If not, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, just to recap a little bit, last week, Jesus fed the 5,000 and then he sent the guys, all the disciples out in the boat through the night to the other shore and they were straining through the night. And then Jesus comes walking on the water and they're afraid and Peter says, if it's you, Lord, let me come out. And he comes out and walks on the water until he looks at the waves, right? And then he sinks and Jesus catches him. And then when they get in the boat, they're already at the other side. So a lot of miraculous things happening last week's lesson. Um, and then this week, all the people come on the shore and they're they're looking for Jesus. Where'd he go? We, we saw the disciples leave, but we didn't see Jesus go with them. So now uh, they find him, they get in the show, on the boat and they go to the other side and uh, they find Jesus there and they ask him a question. So let's go ahead and get started with question number nine and see what, what we're supposed to look for as we do our study. So question number nine says, the crowd was surprised that Jesus was on the other side of the water and they followed him. They asked him, Jesus, when, he had, when had you arrived? Instead of answering their question, Jesus revealed that they were there because they wanted more bread. And this is all found in verses six, uh, chapter six, 22 through 27. What does Jesus tell them in verse 27? And then remembering back, what did Jesus say his food was in John 4, 34? Because we always want the Bible to answer uh, the Bible. It all bears witness. Okay, so let's look. I think what we'll do is start at um, 26, when Jesus is answering them, he says, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. And I just want to pause and say, um, you know, we live in such a fast food society. We can go through a drive through we can go to the grocery store, we can get anything we want, anytime we want. You know, these people couldn't do that. And Jesus had given them food, and it, I, I'm sure it was really good, and they wanted more. And I mean, I, I don't blame them. I, <laughs> I would want more too. Um, but he's calling them on it, right? You're not here for miraculous signs. You're here because you want more food. And then he says, do not work for food that spoils. So regular food, of course it spoils if it sits long enough. Don't work for that. But for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Okay, so what are we supposed to work for? What does he say in verse 27? He says, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. So there is food, there is a work that we can do here that will last into eternity. And we need to figure that out. And so what does he say about it? Which the Son of Man will give you. So he gives us the work that we're supposed to do, but we need to do it. Okay, and then let's look, because Jesus is always our example, right? So. In John 4, 34, he says, My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So that is also Jesus' food. Remember when he was at the well? This is when he was with the Samaritan woman and the disciples brought back food and they said, No, I'm not, I'm I'm fine. And and he was saying that his food was to do the will of him who sent him and to finish his work. So God's priority, you know, our priority in our life should be finishing the work that God's given us to do. I just think that's, um, that's wonderful, but it's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking like, oh no, to sustain myself, I need to do the work that God has called me to do. Okay, let's go to question number 10. It says, during any given day, we spend a lot of time thinking about the food we will eat. 
how much time do you spend thinking about the spiritual food you will eat each day? I guess we have it backwards. Our spirit is on a diet and we struggle to have self-control with our spiritual diet. How could we intentionally eat more spiritual food each day? Okay, what do you think? You can put your answer in the question in the comments down below if you'd like to. Uh, but I just wrote down intentionally eating more spiritual food by um, praying, uh, talking to God, by reading his word, reading and meditating on the Bible, thinking about the Bible, letting it, letting it um, be in my heart and be in my mind, um, asking God for guidance and provision. Uh, and then I said taking opportunities that come along each day. I think that God gives us a lot of opportunities to do work that he's called us to do, but I think it's always a little bit inconvenient. It never just happens and is easy. Uh, I know last night I was, uh, I like to ride my bike and I was on a bike ride and I saw my neighbor, I haven't seen her in forever and I, I kind of rode by and then I thought, oh no, I really should go talk to her. So I turned around and I went and talked to her and it was just um, a really good conversation. I know it was God ordained and I would have missed that if I had kept writing, you know, it's always, um, you have to die to your flesh. I had to die to my flesh and just choose God's work over my desire. And, you know, she had had a really hard day and it was really nice that we were able to connect. So we just need to always be kind of conscious in our mind. Is there something that you want me to do? Is there something that I should uh, accomplish today and, and ask him each day, you know, for divine appointments. And then we got to be faithful to take them when he gives them to us. So that's just an example from, from my life. And if you want to share with me, then let me know. Okay. Let's go to question number 12. It says the crowd wanted a miraculous sign. Their forefathers ate manna in the desert and God had just multiplied physical bread to feed over 5,000 people. But Jesus is now moving to the spiritual. In verses 32 through 33, Jesus says that the bread of heaven is a person who comes down from heaven, and this person gives life to the world, in verse 33. Who is this bread of life, and how does he give life to the world? Okay, so let's read verses 30 through 35. Who is the bread of life, and how does he give life? In verse 30, it says, So they ask him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who had given you bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Remember the woman at the well? He told him the same thing, that you'll never thirst again. So we'll never be hungry or thirsty with Jesus. So what's the answer? The answer to that question is, who is the bread of life? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And he uses the I am statement, which is saying, I am God. And that's how they would understand it. Because when God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, he says, who should I say sent me? And he said, I am that I am. And so in the book of John, we're going to see several I am statements. And this is uh, just one of them. So I am the bread of life. So Jesus is the bread of life. Okay, let's go to our next question. And this is in number 13, and it says, All those the Father gives to Jesus will come to him. He will never drive them away. Jesus is doing the Father's will, not his own will. And then what is the Father's will? So we want to look at 37 to 47, and let's look and see what does it say is the Father's will. So that's what we're looking for. In 37, it says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes, I will never drive away. So isn't that interesting that the Father gives us to Jesus? 
And anyone that comes to Jesus, he'll never drive us away. That's good to know. That means you can't ever mess up too bad that he won't forgive you or take you back. He will never let you go. Okay. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. So he's doing the Father's will. And this is the will of him who sent me. This is our answer, right? This is the will of him who sent me. That I should lose none of all that he has given me. He won't lose us. But he will raise them up the last day. So there's one time. I want you to think about how many times he says, but he will raise us up on the last day. So that's once. In verse 40, it says, For the Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up on at the last day. Okay, that's the second time he's saying it. I'm going to raise him up on the last day. Verse 41, At this the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, now say, I have come down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourself, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. That's the third time I will raise. So he's going to raise us up the last day. There will be a last day and we will be raised up. And I am so thankful for that. Okay, verse 45. It is written in the prophets, they all they will be they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me, comes to Jesus. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. Everlasting life. Eternal life. Everlasting life. How many times have we already heard that in just the first six chapters of John? He has come to give us eternal life. To give us everlasting life. We believe in Jesus. We have everlasting life. It's bigger than this life. It's bigger than what we know. It's bigger than... Um, our physical realm that we can see. It's eternal, eternal life through Jesus, through belief in Jesus. Okay, so what did he do? What was the will of, of, uh, of God, the work that Jesus was to do? And it says um, in verse 39, it says, the will of him who sent me, I shall lose none of all he has given me, but will raise them up, and then verse 40, it says that uh, I will, and whoever believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up the last day. So he's just going to take care of us. He's going to take care of the people that God gives him. And God draws the people to Jesus, and then they receive Jesus. In verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. So Jesus is going to take care of us. He's going to keep us. He's going to help us. He's going to teach us, and he's going to raise us up. That was his work. Okay, so let's look at verse, um, okay, I think that was 13. What was the Father's will? We answered that. So verse 14, question 14, it says, Jesus is the living bread of life. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, and I will give that I will give for the world, life of the world. And this is in verse 48 through 52. Jesus is speaking of a future time. How does Jesus give his flesh for the life of the world? And so let's go ahead and read. Um, but I think that it's it maybe is not real clear here, but let's read. In 48, it says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, and I will give... That which I will give for the life of the world. 
Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Okay, so right here, they are, they're confused. They don't understand. But, you know, Jesus is speaking of when he's going to die. He's going to lay down his life. He's going to let his body be broken and beaten and uh, crucified for us. And he's going to bleed. And <clears throat> because we have the word of God, we want to use the word of God to find a little bit more information. So Hebrews is an excellent resource for anyone who's looking at how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. And in Hebrews uh, 10, and I would say 8 through 22, I, I encourage you to go and read that. It's an excellent passage on how Jesus, uh, through the sacrifice of the blood of uh, the body of Jesus once and for all, um, but there's one specific verse I want to talk about, and it's verse 20. We're in the middle of a sentence. I know that, but I want you to think about uh, his, but talks about Jesus's body. And it says, um, by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. Okay, <clears throat> so what they're talking about here is the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place. So the holy place they could go into regularly, <clears throat> offer sacrifices, but they could only go in the most holy place once a year. <clears throat> and they had to bring blood. It could just be the priest. Um, he had to be clean. And he um, would offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people once a year on atonement day. And so it's talking about the curtain Jesus's body being the curtain, the way into the holy, most holy place where God is. And so his body had to be broken. And let's look what happened when he died. So Matthew 27, and in 51, right before it says, he gave up his spirit. So this is right when Jesus died. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. So at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So the curtain symbolically is Jesus's body and it was torn, it was broken. But, it, but by him dying, he made a way for us to come in to the presence of God. That's why we can approach the throne of grace boldly uh, through Jesus, because he made the way for us to come in and have fellowship. So we don't have to wait for once a year and go through someone else or pray through someone else. We can go directly to God because Jesus paid that price. His body was torn. His body was broken for us. <clears throat> and if you, if you think about it, it was torn from top to bottom. I'm not sure. I think it's like 24 inches thick. The curtain was very thick and hard and it was torn from top to bottom and uh so that's just saying that god did it because it was really tall nobody could do that and god tore it and he made a way into the most holy because of the blood of jesus so that is a beautiful um privilege as a child of god that we have is that we can approach the throne of grace boldly because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because he is the bread of life. His body gives us bread, spiritual bread. Okay, let's go to the next question, which is number 15. Jesus was not speaking of cannibalism. He was speaking of spiritual food representing Jesus's body and blood shed on the cross. <clears throat> Today, we partake of his body and blood in the Lord's communion, and we should do this regularly. This was a hard word because they didn't understand that the Messiah would be dying for the salvation of the world. In verse 53 through 57, <clears throat> but then in 67 through 71, uh, the 12, how did the 12 disciples respond and how should we respond? So let's go ahead and look at the passage 67 through 71. And then 
He's saying, okay, well, I'll start at 66. It says, from that time on, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the 12. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Then Jesus replied, have I not chosen you, the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. He he meant Judas, the son of Iscariot, Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the twelve, would later to betray him. So the question that they pose is, you know, do you want to leave? And Simon Peter says, Lord, whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Okay. That's how we should reply, too. We should say, no. A lot of trains today. Sorry about that. Okay, so what should we say? You are the Christ. And keep following. We should also say, nope, who else would I follow? You are the Christ. It's not an easy path, you know? It's The Christian life is, a lot of people would think, oh, this is just an easy path. But it's not, it's not an easy path. But it's a great path. And you don't do it alone. You do it with God. And so sometimes we don't understand things. That's okay. We don't have to know it all. He does. We have to trust and believe, and he will take care of us. So just like Simon, we have to say, to whom would we go? No, we're going to follow you. We follow you, Jesus. We believe. Okay, our closing paragraph for today is, once again, Jesus is satisfying real physical needs in supernatural ways, multiplying bread for the hungry and walking on water to rescue the 12 from the storm. Then he introduces a spiritual principle that is hard to understand. Jesus is the bread of life. And when he comes down, came down, and when we come to him, we will never go hungry. And when we believe in him, we will never be thirsty. Praise God for his infinite wisdom, revelation, provision, and love for us. May we become spiritually mature as we partake of Christ our Savior. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed studying a little bit about the bread of life. And I hope that you do believe. Uh, and I'm excited that you joined me today. And I look forward to next time. So until then, I hope you have a great day. Bye.